Today, we're going to talk about Alex Murda. He is on, or Murda, however you pronounce it. He's on the stand, and Greg wants to tell us about the videos we're going to watch. So he took the stand as a defense witness, and this is a very finite set of the questions that he responded to in cross. You're telling this jury that that's what happened, and you were back at the house at 849, and you lay down on the couch and dozed for a second, and then you were up with more steps in a shorter time period than you had done all day. Well, I mean, your number is 849. What I'm telling this jury is that I went down there, and when I took that chicken from Bubba, I would have said something to Mags. I got back on that golf cart, and I drove back to my house. After getting back to my house, I went inside, and in short order, I went to the couch. That's what I'm telling this jury. Did you go anywhere, anywhere else in the house? Mr. Waters, I can't tell you specifically about that. I, I don't think so, but I may have. Did you have that tan blackout and a 12-gauge shotgun on that golf cart when you drove down there? No. You didn't? No. Did you see them when the, you were down there? No. No. So we got you back around 849 and you're leaving at 902, correct? And you didn't see any weapons down there. You just happened to be back there. You didn't hear anything at all. Did you hear anything at all, Mr. Murdoch, during that time period? No, I did not. You didn't? Didn't you tell law enforcement that you thought you heard them pull up? Didn't you tell law enforcement that? I did think they had okay. pulled up. All right, so that was that you did think that? Yes. All right. So now you're saying there was a car pulling up? No. You didn't testify to that yesterday, did you, in your new version of events that no, I, you I don't construct? Mr. Waters, I don't believe there was a car pulling up. Okay. But that's what you told law enforcement, didn't you? No. I told law enforcement that I thought they had pulled up. Okay. All right. But you're saying you couldn't hear blackout shots, supposedly, but you could hear that, correct? I didn't say I couldn't hear blackout shots, but I'm saying that I thought when, when I got up, from taking a nap, if I took a nap, but when I got up from laying down, as I was getting ready to go to my mom's, there was a point in time where I thought Maggie and Paul had come back. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so my understanding is he is part of an established family there in that area, established in the law. I don't know whether he or any of his members of the family have ever been mayor of the area. Scott, I can tell you this, he's definitely the mayor of Qualifier Town. In the, get your T-shirts, <laughs> get your T-shirts in the store. Uh, he says, I'm what I'm telling this jury, that's... That's not, that's a qualifier. What I'm telling this jury doesn't mean it's necessarily the truth or a fact. What I'm saying, uh, I would have, um, if I, um, I can't tell you specifically, and I don't believe. Lots and lots of qualifiers. I'm just giving you a, a few there. That is a signal there that there's not necessarily some accuracy or truth going on. What's the other signal left in there for me? Uh, when when he's cornered about the idea of he couldn't hear anything, but surely he heard the police car, we see him reel back and he starts adapting on the microphone there. That is moving the microphone. He doesn't need to do that. And so I think that's a true adapter to the stress of being cornered. And also, I believe we're going to see this time and time and time again throughout this when he's put in a corner or under some stress and pressure. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is answers as, as prepared as it can be. He, of course, being a former prosecutor and, and being in that world, we're seeing two, uh, form, a, a real prosecutor and a former prosecutor go head to head. So we're seeing a lot going on here. We're not seeing um, any huge cues of stress right now. His blink rate's pretty low. And there's not a lot of illustrating from the extremities. You know, not, a lot, not a lot of of moving around with his hands and arms. And some are going to see those nods when he was saying uh, uh, of yes, when it should be no, are cues of deception. They aren't. Those are what I call confirmation nods when he's saying no, but his head's going yes. Now, had they been small, if he said uh, no and his head had gone like this and kept going, that's a different story. We see a little bit of that, but that's not – it doesn't mean he's lying or telling the truth. But if someone in another situation – similar to this, is saying no, and their head goes like that. <clears throat> According to Paul Ekman, that is one of the things you want to look for 
who make sure you're, you're dealing with someone not being deceptive. We see a couple of short shoulder shrugs as he goes through this. Obviously, he's not going to be as confident with what he's saying because he's on the spot. A lot of people are watching now. He's aware that everybody in the world is probably watching this or so many people are. But I still think there's a questionable step going on here. Um, all right, that's, that's all I get. Chase, what do you got? So I'm going to approach this by what's missing in a lot of these videos. So we'll, we'll just follow. I'll use this uh, behavioral profiling template for the rest of the videos that are coming up as well as this one. And there's something missing here. And it's a denial of circumstances is what we're seeing here. He's not denying anything else but circumstances. So his story is not about what happened. And he says it himself. It's not about what happened. His story is about what he's telling the jury. And one thing, Mark, you you nailed it. He says, I would have said something to Mags. He didn't say that he did. And if this did happen, I would have said something to Mags. I don't think that's there. And when he's asked about the shotgun and the rifle beat on the golf cart, this is strange and unusual head nodding. May very well be a confirmation nod. Let's keep taking a look and see what you know, where his nods are, where his head shakes are, because somebody to just say one thing means one thing. We may be uh, looking at something else. We'll take a look at the next ones, though. But this is unusual for him uh, based on his behavior in the police vehicle and a few other videos. But it doesn't I don't think we're seeing that meaning deception by itself at all. So, Scott, I do agree with you. And people do it all the time. He doesn't very often. Greg. Yeah, <clears throat> so a couple of things. One is he's clearing up details for a reason because he admitted that he had lied about not being at the house at the time of the murder. He was supposedly away. Now he's coming back and his ploy as in his testimony was to tell you how pathetic he's been in the past for stealing from clients, including quadriplegic underage people and all that. And to say, yes, and I lied and, and, and now let's see how that works out for him in the long term. I'm also going to tell you there are two examples of the organism doing what the organism has made the organism successful in this video. One of them is him doing over and over. And one of them is me because I didn't prepare for this. I'm watching these videos and telling you what I see. And so this will be you getting as close to cold as I can get. There is a place where his blink rate does increase when they say, where else did you go in the house? Well, if he's running around and picking up weapons to go down and do something, he would probably get a little blink rate increase around that. There's also a couple of things that you listening to him may find interesting, dis and dat. This is an educated guy who talks that way. And you may say, well, that doesn't play well for him. Well, it may very well play well for him in low country. And Mark, to your point, he's part of a long legacy of prosecutors. Like 1920 to 2006, his family held the office of solicitor, which is prosecutor there. And he is an assistant prosecutor, which means he has a badge. Now, we said before he wasn't somebody who said he's not. He is. He's in, he has badges. He has been a volunteer in that program. You also, if you'll watch him, he, he says a hard no when they ask him about the blackout and the shotgun, because those are the murder weapons. So he's prepared that. Scotty does your loping. I can tell he's prepared because he's telling. Boom, 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 boom. Until, and Mark, that's you with the downward intonation. That's telling until they start asking questions. And then his pattern, his cadence, his everything shifts he came here to tell a story, and when he gets the chance, he does tell that story. What's interesting to me is when he was telling the police hours after the murder of his wife and son, who's had been blown out, and he found him on the side of the road, he or on the side of the building, he had no grief whatsoever. Now it's suddenly got a grief muscle when it's about him on the stand. Could be Botox, and he hasn't had any, but I don't think that's what it is. I think we're seeing something different, and I just think what you need to pay attention to is all that. Scott, you brought it up early, all that prosecutor, all that attorney language we're going to see here. But Mark, you're dead on. He's going to qualify. He's going to ask and parse facts and make the question what he wants to answer. That's all I see. And you're telling this jury that that's what happened. And you were back at the house at 849 and you lay down on the couch and doze for a second. And then you were up with more steps in a shorter time period than you had done all day. Well, I mean, your number is 849. What I'm telling this jury is that I went down there, and when I took that chicken from Bubba, I would have said something to Mags. I got back on that golf cart, and I drove back to my house. After getting back to my house, I went inside, and in short order, I went to the couch. That's what, 
I'm telling this jury. Did you go anywhere, anywhere else in the house? Mr. Waters, I can't tell you specifically about that. I, I don't think so, but I may have. Did you have that tan blackout and a 12 gauge shotgun on that golf cart when you drove down there? No. You didn't? No. Did you see them when the, you were down there? No. No. So we got you back around 849 and you're leaving at 902, correct? And you didn't see any weapons down there. You just happened to be back there. You didn't hear anything at all. Did you hear anything at all, Mr. Murdoch, during that time period? No, I did not. You didn't? Didn't you tell law enforcement that you thought you heard them pull up? Didn't you tell law enforcement that? I did think they had okay. pulled up. All right, so that was that you did think that? Yes. All right. So now you're saying there was a car pulling up? No. You didn't testify to that yesterday, did you, in your new version of events that no, I, you I don't construct? Mr. Waters, I don't believe there was a car pulling up. Okay. But that's what you told law enforcement, didn't you? No, I told law enforcement that I thought they had pulled up. Okay. All right. But you're saying you couldn't hear blackout shots, supposedly, but you could hear that, correct? I didn't say I couldn't hear blackout shots, but I'm saying that I thought when, when I got up from taking a nap, if I took a nap, but when I got up from laying down, as I was getting ready to go to my mom's, there was a point in time where I thought Maggie and Paul had come back. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial, is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. Chase, what do you got? So I'm going to leave body language out of this for right now. So I want you to consider something from a profiling only perspective. So if someone's family members are killed and they want to find out what happened, what reasonable or sane person would lie about their story? So what are the circumstances where immediately after a murder or an incident like this, a person decides to lie about their day? So in a lot of cases, guilty people are going to admit to one lie so they can appear to be coming clean. We might call this a micro or a mini confession. And this sometimes serves to alleviate this natural human desire to confess. And this admission about lying makes guilty people feel like they're admitting fault. And unconsciously, they believe that they're shaping how we see them. So if they're coming clean about this one thing, they must not be guilty. So that might be something that we're seeing here. And this is just a tremendous red flag that the, the lie is there existing in the first place. Mark? Uh, yeah, so he is very good at not answering with yes or no answers as the prosecutor is trying to rally him in, into simple yes or no. Uh, he'll tend to repeat the question back in the opposite of how it's been put forward. I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. Again, not contracted. So very clear and uncontracted in telling you the opposite of what he's being rallied into. And I think that's that's purposeful. He knows what the prosecutor is trying to do, get him to say yes or no answers. It's going to be simpler to, to put him in a corner if he'll do yes or no. Let me just pick up on one element of body language, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, you're right, Greg, that we had we didn't in the um in the first visit with the police see any forehead action. We got a lot of forehead action here. So we've got to think to ourselves, well, is he is he putting it on to show concern or is he actually concerned and under pressure? In order to work out which one it is, I would put alongside that that his his chest is very concave at the moment. Shoulders are in, chest is concave, protecting vital organs on the body, as we we often say. So I might bias towards the stress. The stress in the forehead is potentially real stress 
at this point, not a concern that he's putting on for the audience. Now, I, I could be wrong. It could be the opposite. But all I'm saying to you is, look, I'm trying to put information together to come to a best a best guess conclusion and then always test my guesses test my guesses about what else do i see what else do i know what do my friends around me think it is what are other experts around me think it is so at the moment i would bias towards he's th though he's used to this situation from not the the side that he's on at the moment but the other side though he's used to that court he's not used to being here he could be under real stress and pressure here uh, greg what do you think what do you got on this one yeah let's start off by talking about the liar's loop something scott and i have in the in the true crime workshop but the liar's loop says you get a trigger and then you got to fabricate and then you get to you deconflict inside your head then you pitch then you get challenged now when you get challenged you have to defend and then what happens to you is you get in a spiral if, they, if the questioner is doing a good job. Well, he had time between the time he actually executed, let's assume he killed her. He had time or his family. He had time after he killed to fabricate for information while he was waiting for the police and 911. Now we're gonna hear a lot of really interesting details as we go. So he's deconflicted that stuff in his head and Chase, what you're talking about, I think is a pave, kind of a paving stone. If I flip this paving stone over, you won't check the rest. We'll say there's where the problem is. And what he's doing, I always call that trading guilt. He'll throw out some guilt that read, it's an ultimate redirect. Look, I lied, I lied, I'm sorry I lied. And you redirect to there. We'll find out later when he said he lied. And interestingly for the four of us, we all saw it when he was in the car. We knew something changed, all this red flagged his baseline deviation and he admits that's when he decided to lie. But interestingly, he's got all that grief muscle, the concern, all this stuff showing up in his head. And we say grief muscle is the arch, but these muscles actually are part of that. And that grief muscle is a combination of five muscles. I want you to listen to the difference in the way he responds to the first two questions. One is telling, boom, boom, boom. And the other is halting and shifting as he goes through it. So something has changed in the way he is responding to the two questions. He's got something there that he did before. Um, that's good enough. I'll just leave it at that. And Scott, what do you got? I think right here, um, his story didn't work. So he's trying to come in, he's coming with something else and it's messed up his timeline. So he's having to go back and try to correct that. I think that's part of what's given the stress here as well. But at the same time, he's so focused on that prosecutor because his blink rate is low. His eyes are a little bit wise compared to what they've been in the, in what we've seen up to this point. And uh, when he has that direct eye contact, when they lock, it lasts even longer. I mean, it, between blinks. So I think that was really interesting. Uh, he doesn't use any illustrators at all. He's really still. And that's, that lets us know something's up here because he's really careful about what he's saying. He has to couch everything perfectly because this could be the question that sends him to the pokey for the rest of his life. That's what I got. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial. Is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. And then you would agree with me that from 902 to 906, your phone finally comes to life and starts showing a lot of steps. I do agree with that. What were you doing? I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. Getting ready to go? I thought you took a shower already. You were just laying down on the couch. What, what all you need to do to get ready to go to your mom's house? Uh, I mean, there wasn't anything to get ready in, in that aspect, wasn't but anything to get ready, I was, was getting it? ready to go. I was preparing to leave. So doing what? I don't know if I got up, uh, went to the bathroom. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly what I was doing. And that's far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior, as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? That's Going to the bathroom? No, I don't, I don't think that I get on a treadmill? went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jog in place? No, nope, I didn't jog didn't in jump place. Jacks? No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? 
preparing to leave for my mom's house. What? What does that mean? I mean, you're in the front room on that couch where you say you laid down. The Suburban's just right outside. What all are you doing? I don't know if I got up and went to my room, went to the gun room, doing went back in that. Doing what? You've been so clear in your new story about everything. What, what were you doing during these four minutes? I, I disagree with your assertion about every detail. I don't recall. I know that I was getting up and I was leaving. I was going to check on my mom. But specifically what I was doing, I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything uh, as I believe you've implied that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, there's a couple of things in this one that are interesting. Scott, you always point out, you know, he do, does a single shoulder shrug and he raises his shoulder, he points his chin toward it when he says, didn't go to the bathroom. Well, I go clean out the traps in that bathroom and find what I found there. I don't know if they did that or not, but that's usually where you'll find evidence because people are not smart enough to unscrew the J trap and flush it out. So you'll find evidence in there. And that whether that's DNA from whatever's going on or whether you find blood. Uh, he has grief muscle we see in the beginning of this, but he's got request for approval, his forehead up and eye lock at all times. Very low blink, just really good eye lock. What we always refer to as a romancer. He's paying, well, there's nothing romantic about that stare. That's, I think you said, Mark, he looks like a predator following him around the room. When he talks about the treadmill, he has a lip compression. So there's some withheld information there. You got to wonder why. And then, um, he, you know, uh, let me, one last thing. Yeah, Mark, you pointed out he's hollow. This is in the South. If you look at old pictures, and this is a big man. He, I think he's six four. Mm. And if I would have described him before all of this as corn fed, to use Southernism, he's a big old boy, and <laughs> he lost all that weight, and so his clothes are different, and he sits different because he's accustomed to holding all that weight and holding it differently. I think it's part of why we see that posture shift. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. He, he, he seems like one of those guys that would like sit around his house in a kimono, a kimono and his underwear all the time. It's saying, you know, answering the phone and cooking and stuff like that. But he came over, he put his clothes on real quick. Anyway, so now 283 steps doesn't sound like a whole lot, a whole lot of steps. But if you try to walk that off in your house in about four minutes, that's a whole lot of steps happening right there. I mean, that that actually is a lot. And what I think was happening there, I know we're not supposed to say, here's what I think happened. I think he's walking around going, oh, no, oh, no, now what do I do? I got to make sure everything's covered. Oh, oh, you know, no, you know, on the phone, calling people, all that stuff. Because he's got a couple of phone calls in there. So I think there's a lot going on there. I think he's uh, he's walking around in a panic because he's just done all this stuff. So he's, he's up and running around. Uh, he continues pretty much with the same body language and the verbal delivery. And just a little bit more illustrating, but not a whole lot more. And the prosecutor's trying to get him all worked up. And it's slowly but surely working because we see him start to get a little bit tense. We do see some stuff in the in his brow. But again, that's I got some theories about what's going on up there, but I'll, I'm going to save them for a little bit. And again, I think the great part is we're watching these two attorneys sort of uh, battle each other. And they've, they've both got their glasses on. They're looking down their noses at each other. So there's no reason for for, for Mur Did you say Murdoch or Murdoch? He says Murdoch. Is, which one is it? Does it matter? I don't think it matters. I think it's a local, what he pronunciation, local pronunciation. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, so he's got his, his all the way down to the tip of his nose. He's not even using them. I haven't seen him use his glasses yet but he's looking down his nose at, at this attorney. And I think that's part of that psychological thing they've got going on back and forth. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I agree, Greg. He um, He's really locked uh, his target there. Uh, there is a, what you might call a predatory gaze. And Scott, you were, you were bringing that up. I, I was just agreeing with that. Um, yeah, predatory gaze there. He knows where the, the, um, the target should be and where the conflict uh, is going to come from. Uh, yeah, I, I looked up his height as well, uh, Greg, because in order to work out how much ground you can cover with that amount of steps, you need to know the height of the person because the human bodies are, are, are um, you know, that is how, that's how tall I am. For example, if you hold your hands out like that, the distance from your fingertips is how tall you are. <laughs> it doesn't work for you? Okay. No, I'm, I'm about six foot six, Rich. <laughs> okay. Some people, some people are slightly shorter in their legs or longer in their legs. It, it, it depends, but it, it kind of roughly works. 
So with that amount of steps, you can cover, you can cover around about easily a quarter of a kilometer uh, in distance. Now, if you're going up and down steps or things like that, it won't quite work out, but you could cover a lot of ground as a six foot four uh, guy uh, in that amount of time. You're going at quite a pace and you're going at quite a crack there. Anyway, uh, all of that aside, what interests me most is that he answers via the negative all the time. This is what I wasn't doing that day. I didn't do that. I disagree. I don't know. I don't recall. Um, I, I didn't go on the treadmill. It's all via the, the negative. I can promise you what I wasn't doing that day rather than promising you what he was doing that day. And that's important for trying to convict somebody of something because you can't convict people on what on the negative you can't prove and you can't prove what isn't there you can only prove what is there so he he really knows what he's doing i think in this situation now whether it will pay off for him and whether people can see past that it doesn't really matter whether jury can see past it they need positive evidence of something, not the idea of, of something that wasn't happening, I, I would suggest. So no specifics at all, just themes, the themes of I was getting ready to visit my mum, uh, I was going to check on my mum, that's a theme. And he says no specifics and he rejects all implications that come. So all of that to say, he's tough to pin down. He's tough to pin down because he won't answer questions only in the negative. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you. One thing here, though, you listen to him talk in the beginning of this clip. First, he suggests he might have gone to the bathroom. Then when opposing counsel asks him about going to the bathroom, he says he probably didn't go. This is just weird. All the details here and the filling of gaps shows us something interesting. He's uncomfortable with uncertainty. People who are being honest about not remembering will often have no problem at all reasserting that they're unable to remember. And they'll most often just make a firm stand and a confident statement that they don't remember. I don't remember. So they're confident because they aren't hiding anything. So remember this head shake thing. In this clip, every single denial about the treadmill, jogging in place and all that, he knows for sure these things are not true. You see a perfect uh, horizontal head shake uh, each and every time. Then when he's making a denial at the end here about cleaning off guns, you see a definite nodding as he denies this. This might indicate two potential things. I'll let you decide. One, he's nodding for confirmation to the jury to confirm because he kind of looks that direction. Two, there's a gesture mismatch potentially of possible deception. And as a quick note, if you ever want to just kind of defeat an interrogator, the phrase I don't remember is the most difficult thing for people like us to overcome and deal with. Maybe I shouldn't say. No, one more one more thing. If if he was in an interrogation and that bathroom thing came up, Chase, all they got to do is use the bait question there and say, hey, listen, because they've already been in search of this place. They could say, hey, listen, man. Is there any reason whatsoever that your DNA or their DNA would be in your bathroom, any blood, anything like that? You know, any, any reason whatsoever. Now, they could have been in the house and been in there earlier and stuff, but you can make up something like how fresh it was or how new it was, because he's not going to know the details on that with the way tech is these days. So that's that's one thing they could have gone down the road there. What are you going to say, Greg? Yeah, I believe he lives on a septic tank. There's a ton of opportunity to find stuff. Because yeah. anything that you wash down the drain goes straight in the septic tank. So yeah. don't know. Don't know if that's what they've searched. But I didn't hear any scientific evidence. Don't know. And then you would agree with me that from 902 to 906, your phone finally comes to life and it starts showing a lot of steps. I do agree with that. What were you doing? I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. Getting ready to go? I thought you took a shower already. You were just laying down on the couch. What, what all you need to do to get ready to go to your mom's house? Uh, I mean, there wasn't anything to get ready in, in that aspect, wasn't but anything to get ready, I was wasn't. getting ready to go. I was preparing to leave. So doing what? I don't know if I got up, <laughs> went to the bathroom. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly what I was doing. And that's far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior, as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? That's Going to the bathroom? 
No, I, I don't. I don't think that I get on a treadmill. Went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jog in place. No, nope, I didn't jog didn't in jump place. Jacks. No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? Preparing to leave for my mom's house. What? What does that mean? I mean, you're in the front room on that couch where you say you laid down. The Suburban's just right outside. What all are you doing? I don't know if I got up and went to my room, went to the gun room, doing went back in the Doing what? You've been so clear in your new story about everything. What, what were you doing during these four minutes? I, I disagree with your assertion about every detail. I don't recall. I know that I was getting up and I was leaving. I was going to check on my mom. But specifically what I was doing, I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything uh, as I believe you've implied that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. Okay. Do you know why so many phone calls were missing from the log around this relevant time period when law enforcement downloaded your phone on June 10th? From my phone? Yeah. No, I don't. Did you delete them, Mr. Murdoch? Not intentionally. Just around the time of June 7th, all these calls were missing, but you had nothing to do with that between June 7th and June 10th. No, sir, I did not, mm -hmm. and I did not delete phone calls from my phone. Mr. Waters, one of the most important things in this whole thing for me has been getting this data that I believe would exist. Phone calls and phone records um, would be part of that. I've been in enough civil cases and used phone records enough times to know that you delete a phone call from your phone, it doesn't disappear. So I can tell you, this jury, and everybody who's listening that I did not intentionally delete phone calls from my phone. Yeah, because you started talking about the, you're, you're a former prosecutor, correct, and former lawyer doing civil cases. We went through that yesterday. And boy, you're busy bee on that phone and right out of the gate at 902, right? Get the comments. Objections overruled. Am I a busy bee? Yeah. I, I am using my telephone at, I think I call at 9.05, I start and call my dad and I agree that I made other phone calls. And one of the first things you start talking about with law enforcement is these calls that you made to Maggie. Correct? You remember, recall that from your first statement to law enforcement? One of the first things that I said to law enforcement? Yeah, that's one of the things you talk about. I'm talking about with your interview with Special Agent Dave Owen. I don't remember that being the first thing we talked about, but first things. if Mr. Owens asked me about it, then I... No, you brought sure. it up, didn't you? I did. You don't recall? No, I don't, I don't recall. Yep. All right, Chase, what do you got? It's just a sea of what, what we call non-contracted denials where I, I did not, I do not, instead of didn't or don't. And secondly, he's saying, I can tell you and I can tell this jury, I can tell you. It doesn't mean that he's saying that at all. So that when anything comes up, they're essentially, well, I didn't say that. I just said that I could say that. So this is a kind of a backing out. When he says not intentionally, the blink rate goes into a huge spike, what I call a context spike. So this is a key moment where I would be looking for it and we're seeing a big little a uh, big mountain of, of blink right there. And then he goes in right still at this spot when he's saying not intentionally, there's shuffling in the chair, which is not a common behavior for him. There's immediate adapting and uh, adjusting this mic. And there's this discussion of the first things he's saying to the police here. And one thing we've seen since the beginning of this case is that every effort that's made is focused at his innocence his story, his timeline, his suffering, and his personal tragedy. And the minuscule amount of time that he spends vaguely and softly suggesting that he'd like to find out who did this is washed out here by his fear of shrinking the pool of potential sus suspects. So either he's got 
no concern for who did this or why they did it, which in itself should be horrifying. Or there's a chance he's very sure who did this. And his career in law in law has just convinced him that the facts win cases. As a lawyer, he got convinced that facts win cases, that if he could just inject enough facts, his emotions aren't relevant whatsoever. Scott? All right. He's so nervous that when he says not intentionally, he moves forward because he's trying to get that point across, that the not intentionally part, that his chin hits that mic. And that's how intense this is for him because he knows this is important. He's trying to stay calm. But as Joe Navarro says, you can have a poker face, but you can't have a poker body. So no matter how calm he's trying to stay, his body is telling us everything that's going on, most everything anyway, because he's doing a great job of, of um, trying to stay calm, but he's not doing very well because this is the most animated we've seen him yet up to this point. His stress level is really starting to rise up because that uh, attorney is poking at him, making him, getting him mad, trying to make him angry. And it's working. It's working for him. He tries to get his old his old status as a prosecutor and attorney. He's trying to use that to say, yeah, I know that if you delete phone, you know, delete phone calls off your phone, you can see it. On. But when he was thinking about doing this, when he was planning this out, he didn't think it would go that far. He didn't think they'd say, oh, you you know, you're going to be in trouble for, for he didn't go that far. That's what he was doing. He's walking around his house, freaking out, deleting phone calls and things like that on his phone. That goes back to those 283 steps. I think that's what was going on there. And again, we see more head, torso, and arm, arm movements in this clip than anything up to this point. So his his stress level is rising, and he's getting a little bit angry at this point. I think that the uh, prosecutor is doing a pretty good job on, on firing him up. Greg, what do you got? And this is a really good one because he does some distancing techniques a couple of times. He repeats the question twice. He says, my phone? Well, no, that guy's phone. What the hell do you think I'm talking about? Number one. Then when he gets to the second one where he says the first thing, first thing we said, and he chaffs and redirects. And Scott, I think all of his talking, and for those of you who don't watch us all the time, chaff and redirect comes from an aircraft throwing flares to get missiles to follow the, instead of the plane. Same idea. If I regurgitate enough stuff, I used to be a prosecutor and I know when I know, and then he redirects and he just hides in all that garbage that he's throwing out there. There's some social signaling here, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, because he is in his element still. Regardless of what you want to say, he's still in South Carolina. He's still in a place where people understand the way he speaks and all those things. While he says, my phone, and he starts to deny, look at that head shake, or that head shake is not like anything we've seen to now, where he usually does this, Chase, you pointed out earlier. There's a quick... Like if you ever see a dog when they're nervous, they move rapidly. You're seeing that with him. So we know he's under his skin. We can see that happening. He interrupts himself to start to throw out some guilt in there when he starts to talk about, well, I know, and I didn't do that. Maybe I mistakenly deleted it. There's a, Chase, you would call it a vanishing perpetrator. Somebody's had his phone and been deleting messages, I guess. So he's saying, no, 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 I was so confused or whatever. So he gets away from it. But he edits as he speaks there. He then repeats that question. And when he says the first thing, he doesn't even answer the question. He does a really slick redirect, say not the first thing we talked about, that's a redirect. So it gives him the chance to, for you to have to ask a second, third and fourth question to get there. He touches his chest at one point, and some of us are gonna say probably if you think culturally that could mean something. If you're from low country, South Carolina, and people do this when they say something and they're being genuine, he may do that to persuade people. In the Middle East, it's common for people to put their hand to their chest when they're being honest or when they're being sincere. Same thing could be true in low country. I would venture to say probably there. You know, we are all Southern boys are raised by Southern women, and a lot of Southern women will do that in that process. And finally, I'd say this. This guy has a legacy, a long legacy, where his family has been the prosecutors or solicitors in that area for 100 years. He's been involved with it. And everybody in that culture in that Maslow is going to recognize him as somebody, a big fish in that pond somehow. So whatever cultural signaling he's sending that we aren't even aware of is going to impact their decision-making ability and how they perceive this situation. Why would this powerful person do that is what he's trying to signal out. And that's a, that's a survival thing. Now they chose to put him on the stand and for him to go in and say, yes, I stole from people. And yes, I did this. And yes, I was a drug user. And no, I don't know where $12 million went, but that doesn't make me a murderer. If I'll concede these things, why wouldn't I concede that? Chase, we're back to what you were talking about earlier. 
And back to where I said, if you flip the stone over, they'll stop looking and say, oh, oh yeah, yeah, he's a liar. He's a thief. He's a drug user, but he probably didn't kill his family. I think that's what we're seeing. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so if you go back to our previous episode on this guy, you'll notice that we recognized in the car that the phone was going to be an issue, that there's something incongruent with some some kind of call in there. And here it is coming up. And here it is. We are seeing that extra pressure and stress come on him at this point. Chase, you're right. Facts will win the case. Well, when I was studying logic, here's what I understood to be a fact. For a fact, you need um, sensible data. By sensible data, that means it has to be sen sensed. You've got to be able to touch it, taste it, smell it, uh, see it, hear it. And for it to be a really good fact, you need at least three separate pieces of sensible data. And he, so the guy says, look, you know, these records just don't disappear. Yeah, but if you eliminate one of the pieces of sensible data, you may be only left with another piece or two more pieces, and it's harder to form a fact for a jury. So you well know if you can destroy some elements of sensible data, you diminish the idea of somebody having a fact in front of them. They can maybe still get a fact out of it, but does it really convince a jury? So I would say he's clever. He knows what he's doing here uh, with this missing log because he says, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't, well, did you delete them? Not intentionally. So probably you deleted them. Probably you did. They're certainly deleted, aren't they? They've certainly gone. And I don't know who else has access to the phone. And I'm not sure how you delete these things unintentionally. I mean, it's possible. It's possible. But now, look, look what's happened. We're into the realm of possibility. And possibility isn't fact. And we want facts in order to uh, convict somebody. Uh, around this, we get the microphone adaption, just has been said before. We get eye blocking. We get swinging from side to side. One more I'll add to that is we get a, a shoulder barge as well. The shoulder just moves forward and barges forward with that. So I think you're right, Scott. He's getting he's getting more aggressive as we go forward. We'll see that escalate going forward as well. There, that's all I got on that one. Do you know why so many phone? calls were missing from the log around this relevant time period when law enforcement downloaded your phone on June 10th? From my phone? Yeah. No, I don't. Did you delete them, Mr. Murdoch? Not intentionally. Just around the time of June 7th, all these calls were missing, but you had nothing to do with that between June 7th and June 10th. No, sir, I did not. Mm -hmm. And I did not delete phone calls from my phone. Mr. Waters, one of the most important things in this whole thing for me has been getting this data that I believe would exist. Phone calls and phone records um, would be part of that. I've been in enough civil cases and used phone records enough times to know that you delete a phone call from your phone, it doesn't disappear. So I can tell you, this jury, and everybody who's listening that I did not intentionally delete phone calls from my phone. Yeah, because you started talking about the, your, your former prosecutor, correct, and former lawyer doing civil cases. We went through that yesterday. And boy, you're busy bee on that phone and right out of the gate at 902, right? Get the comments. Objections overruled. Am I a busy bee? Yeah. I, I am using my telephone at I think I call at 9.05, I start and call my dad, and I agree that I made other phone calls. And one of the first things you start talking about with law enforcement is these calls that you made to Maggie, correct? You remember, recall that from your first statement to law enforcement? One of the first things that I said to law enforcement? Yeah, that's one of the things you talk about. I'm talking about with your interview with Special Agent Dave Owen. I don't remember that being the first thing we talked about, but first things. if Mr. Owens asked me about it, then I... No, you brought sure. it up, didn't you? I did. You don't recall? No, I don't, I don't recall. Would you dispute me if I said you brought it up? Did I brought up what? Brought your up phone, what? Mr. Murdoch, your phone. Phone calls to Maggie? Yes. That I brought up phone calls to Maggie to David Owens. 
I'm asking you, is that one of the things that you talked about in your first interview with Dave Owen? That you pulled out your phone and started looking at it, that you brought that up? Do you recall that? Well, but that's not what you asked, Mr. Owens. You, you asked me, was that the first thing that I talked to him about? And that was the discrepancy. I certainly don't dispute that Mr. Owens and I talked about phone calls. But that's not what you said, so just right. to be clear. Well, the real reason, Mr. Murdoch, is that you as a lawyer and prosecutor are up at 902, finally having your phone in your hand, moving around and making all these phone calls to manufacture an alibi. Is that not true? That's absolutely incorrect. So that's just another circumstance and coincidence in this particular case right around the time that you lied to law enforcement about maybe one of the most important facts in the case. Objection to the comment before the question. It is an absolute fact that I am not manufacturing an alibi, as you say. How do you remember so much detail about everything else, but you don't remember what you were specifically doing to generate 283 steps while you're making these, all these phone calls in the same four-minute period? I remember unequivocally, without any doubt, with as clear a mind as I could have mm -hmm. at any time, that I never manufactured any alibi in any way, shape, or form because I did not and would not hurt my wife and my child. So, why so I know for a fact that I never, ever, ever created an alibi. Why don't you remember what you were doing when you were so busy for this four minute critical period? I do other remember what I was, I was doing. Other than I was getting ready to go. Well, that's because that's what I was doing. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so let me follow this logic idea just because it interests me and I hope it interests all of you uh, as well. What we've got here is is and I think why it's kind of confounding the prosecution as well, and there feels to me to be a bit of a stalemate on at the moment, um, is there's a bit of black box thinking here going on. Uh, and I get this from a, a client that I have who um, his, his, his industry, his job, is there are transactions that get done in the financial industry in what's called a black box. It means you can't see what happens in there. And the reason you can't see what happens is if you knew what was happening, you might be able to do it faster than the person doing the transaction. So what he does is, is he looks outside the box and predicts based on looking outside the box, what's going to happen in the box. And if he can do it faster, he manages to do the transaction before the transaction happens. And you make a lot of money doing that. Well, what this guy is saying is saying, look, I'll tell you what isn't happening inside the box, but I won't tell you what is happening inside the box. And he says that by going, um, uh, I, I can, uh, it's an absolute fact that I was not, it's an absolute fact that I was not doing X. Well, number one, the, the, the founder, one of the founders of objectionism, uh, objectivism, Ayn Rand said, you cannot prove a negative. In fact, you cannot be brought into court to prove a negative. Here he is going, I'm going to tell you as a fact what isn't inside the box that you can't see into. Well, that's almost impossible to argue other than the way that I've just argued it with you right now. And were you interested? Do you get it? I mean, could a jury get that? Could a jury go, oh, I see what's happening there. I, I mean, it's just confounding. And so at this point for me, I think there's a real stalemate on. I'm not saying that this guy is, is the brightest person ever, but he knows enough to cause a stalemate and cause a problem in this case. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so you guys know I'm, I'm not as sophisticated as Mark. I'm not going to talk to you about the black box. I'm going to talk to you about fencing in a pig. Because <laughs> this guy's got a pig to talk about here. And he's what he's going to do is by the time you get to his pig or his ugly baby or his whatever, he's going to have shown you enough beautiful things that you forget how ugly his pig is. And what he's doing with words like emphatics, all these words are about absolutely and no way. And I can tell you absolutely what I did not do. 
he gets to very few facts right there in the middle. I didn't kill my family. So he's got lots of room to talk, lots of space there to get to those words before he actually says anything. And then on the backside, he does more of those words. So that's wrapped in this beautiful wrapper, no matter how ugly what the thing he's talking about is. Interestingly, the way he goes about it, his guy asks him a question. And there's a lot of one-upmanship going on between two attorneys right here. You can't miss it. I often hear people say, this looks defensive. And I say, yeah. If that looks defensive, does that look defensive suddenly? No, because I'm looking down my nose at you. And if I'm standing over you, it's powerful. And that guy's doing it. He's looking over the thing and down his glasses at him. So there's a competition between the two of them. This guy forces the prosecutor to rephrase his question three times. Well, that's building the fence. What he's doing is building a wall around the question he's willing to answer. And when he gets down to the end, he is ready for it. And Mark, he's down now to where his shoulders are down, his hands are between his legs or somewhere down there. In Chase, we talk about it all the time from fight or flight. He's created an exoskeleton, but make no mistake, he's not in full-blown fight or flight. What he does, you can tell when he gets to the point he's in charge because his voice tone changes. Now I got you in my box. My pig is safe. Scott, what do you got? I don't follow that. <laughs> All right, his anger, his anger is coming into play here even more because his voice volume goes up, his tone, his uh, tone is stronger, his cadence is sped up a little bit. And again, like you were saying, Greg, there it's two attorneys fighting, man. They've got those glasses down, looking at each other. And like I was saying earlier, Marduk doesn't even use his glasses. I mean, he's not reading anything. He's not he's not holding them up and doing that, and putting them back on. He's just got them on to do that. I think. Also, let's start paying more attention to his forehead and let's see how that, that knitting of his brow, what's happening with that. Because we see anger there as those things come together and they push down like this. Now, if we'll pay attention to his eyes as well, what's happening is when someone gets mad or they pretend they're mad at you and they, they frown and their eyes all squint at you, that's fine. They're not that mad. Take it from me. When someone's sitting across from me and they're getting all mad, there's a, there's a way you can look at it and say, this is real or it's fake. And what you're looking for is when they start squinting their eyes, they want to, they'll start opening them a little bit as they're squinting. It'll look like they're opening them at the same time. Gives them that crazy look that you see in movies. That's what you're looking for. That's how you know if somebody's really mad. Then their face is going to get all red. Just to, to go over here just for a second. Their face will get all red and it's going to go pale. And when it goes pale, that's when they're coming at you. That's when their brain said, okay, we're going. Because all the blood is run from, from the face out to their muscles and their arms and legs because they're coming across the table at you. Or are they going to do whatever they're going to do? So... That's what we're seeing here is the eyes are getting a little bit wide, but that's because they're squinting a little bit and we're seeing the inside, the inside part of that get wide. That's why he's got that, that nutty look on his face. And when he's, again, when he's talking about talking on the phone, when I, when I have to think about something, I get up and I'm one of those people that gets up and walks around in circles and talks and I got to cross my arms and I do this a lot when I'm thinking, I always touch my face and do all that. That's what I, I really think that's what he's doing in there. He's what I think the, the prosecutor nailed it. I think he's in there walking around, maybe not in a panic, but close to it, because that's a lot of steps. It doesn't sound like a lot, 283, but in that short amount of time, when you're on the phone doing that, that's what he's doing. He's walking around, deleting those phone calls, walking around in circles, I would imagine in circles. Uh, also, at the end, he's he uses severity softening when he says, I would never hurt my wife or child. That's severity softening. We see that quite often when someone's done something like this they shouldn't have, and it's horrible. They won't say, I didn't kill my wife and my child, or I wouldn't kill, I wouldn't kill anybody. I didn't kill them. No. They say, I would never hurt them. Well, would you ever shoot them? Would you ever shoot either one of them, both of them, out of the kennel? It's a, that, that's trying to make it sound not as bad, what he did. That's why they do that. It's a subconscious thing quite often. Sometimes it isn't. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. This morning when I was watching this, it was 5 a.m., sun hadn't come up yet, and I reset my step counter, and I did 288 steps Me in too. this hotel room here, and it's it's a lot. It, <laughs> it took me a minute. So I, I just wanted to recreate it and see what that actually was like. And in this video where he says, absolutely incorrect, this is another perfect head nod with a confirmation glance. Uh, to the jury. And there's some severity softening. Scott, you talked about he uses hurt. And paired with that is psychological distancing. Without using the name of wife and child, he just uses wife and child, doesn't say their names. So this lessens the internal feeling of severity. So like instead of steal, somebody might say take. Instead of murder, they might say hurt, like Scott was saying there. 
So people who are innocent are more likely to use the more severe words to illustrate and show you the severity of what happened to their family or what happened to the victim. And also the severity of what they saw, the memory that they saw. If they're not the killer, they want you to understand how severe it is. So those words are more likely to come out in one area, way less likely, which is why, in my opinion, they're more reliable than a lot of things. And also in this sentence, no use of the victim's names here. So we'll call that psychological di distancing. And this is common for guilty people. And I believe it might help to lessen uh, the stress of the denial. Both of these, one compounded with the other behavior we've seen, just turn black. Good As God. we're seeing this, it's we're seeing a career attorney, career attorney who's lived his life using facts to win forgetting that emotions play way more of a role in court than lots of other stuff. Would you dispute me if I said you brought it up? Did I brought up what brought your up phone, what? Mr. Murdoch, your phone. Phone calls to Maggie? Yes. That I brought up phone calls to Maggie to David Owens. I'm asking you, is that one of the things that you talked about in your first interview with Dave Owen? that you pulled out your phone and started looking at it, that you brought that up. Do you recall that? Well, but that's not what you asked, Mr. Owens. You, you, you asked me, was that the first thing that I talked to him about? And that was the discrepancy. I certainly don't dispute that Mr. Owens and I talked about phone calls. But that's not what you said, so just right. to be clear. Well, the real reason, Mr. Murdoch, is that you as a lawyer and prosecutor or up at 902, finally having your phone in your hand, moving around and making all these phone calls to manufacture an alibi. Is that not true? That's absolutely incorrect. So that's just another circumstance and coincidence in this particular case. Right around the time that you lied to law enforcement about maybe one of the most important facts in the case. Yeah, I need before the question. It is an absolute fact that I am not manufacturing an alibi, as you say. How do you remember so much detail about everything else, but you don't remember what you were specifically doing to generate 283 steps while you're making these, all these phone calls in the same four-minute period? I remember unequivocally, without any doubt, with as clear a mind as I could have mm -hmm. at any time, that I never manufactured any alibi in any way, shape, or form because I did not and would not hurt my wife and my child. So, why can't so you I know for a fact that I never, ever, ever created an alibi. Why don't you remember what you were doing when you were so busy for this four minute critical period? I do other remember what I was, I was doing. Other than I was getting ready to go. Well, that's because that's what I was doing. Well, let's keep going. You made those calls to Maggie in that four minute period. You had just seen them a few minutes ago when you say you went down there and came right back. Why didn't you just take that quick little left 1,100 yards away and stop by. See why they didn't answer the call. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with them. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by? There was no reason to. I mean, Matt making multiple missed calls to Maggie and she's so close. And there's a driveway right there. Why do you not just go down there and say, hey guys, I'm heading over there. It, it wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting, I believe I called Maggie and I believe call, I called Paul, but that, that, that's simply me just letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute, I'll be back. The fact that, that they don't answer is not unusual at all. Now, it is odd, it is unusual that they never call me back. Um, and, but, but at that moment, the fact that there's a missed call 
when, when I know they're on the property, I mean, that doesn't even register at all. I, that, that's perfectly normal to try to call somebody who's on the property and not be able to get them. And, and as far as not going down there, uh, there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul, you know? She should be as safe as she could be. Yeah, she should. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is in the beginning of this, we see this attorney or this prosecutor lean in doing that thing again. That's your parent berating you. That's not a questioner. That's your parent saying, where were you tonight? I know where you were and going in at you. And this guy sees it. He's got a grief muscle and a blink rate at no need. We see that grief muscle come in when he says there was no need to go in. And we say that's that little horseshoe arch there. And his blink rate increases as he says that, but only when he's not making eye contact. And we say that a person, when they're concentrating or when they're focused on something, that I, that blink rate decreases. When he goes back to that romancer kind of personality where he only has eyes for the prosecutor and he gets eye lock, the blink rate disappears. Really interesting. We could say that would be a pro, that could be processor speed. I don't think so in this case. I think it's stress. I think he is going back to pay attention. And then his brow does a really weird thing that they didn't answer. It isn't a request for approval. It isn't a quick flex up and hold for a second and drop. It just, there's something fleeting that crosses his brow. Look, does it mean anything? Don't know. But it's different than what we've seen up to now. And being a baseliner, when something is that different, I really want to poke in. And I would have said, hold, hold on. Let's talk about that for a minute. I don't know what's going on in his head there, but it doesn't matter. He is adapting with one hand. As he says, not abnormal. He adapts. And we say that's you touch, you groom, you may do any kind of repetitive behavior to release nervous energy, but it's also relaxing. And he's doing a one-handed batter on deck. He's rubbing his thigh, it appears, from what I can see. That's a way to release, release nervous energy. And then he gets to this, she should be as safe as possible, or some words to that effect. You know, some mouth grooming thing. Well, she should be, but if your son is no longer there, then she can't be. So who knows what those words mean? But those two fleeting brow change and that mouth are really big deviations from baseline. So I'd want to dig in and understand why. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. Overall in this video, there's something missing. So we'll go back to this. In every single video that we do, I'm asking one question first. So when I sit down in the morning to look at these, I only look at them about one time. And I ask this one question above everything else, what's missing, concealed, or hidden in this clip? And in this clip and throughout the others, there's missing regret. Innocent people will almost always express regret, wishing that they could have done something differently. I wish I would have done that. And there's no regret that he didn't go down there. No wish to have the chance to do it again. So this uh, could have been avoided. Only just the communication of facts to support innocence here. And at the end of this clip, there's one of the hallmarks that I look for in every case. And this is called emotional dysregulation. So when he's saying uh, she should be as safe as she could be, I think that's it. We see anger appear on the face when he's trying to show sadness to the jury. And he even turns his face to the jury when he believes the emotion is finally showing up on his face. This happens when somebody's struggling to create an emotion to be persuasive. And a lot of times when this happens, the true emotion comes out instead of the one they're trying to convey. And this shows us the difference between displaying an emotion and feeling an emotion, which is a huge point right here. That's all I got. Mark? Uh, yeah, absolutely agree with that. Uh, let me take you through it from my point of view. It's an interesting battle that's going on here. You get the prosecutor at the start saying, let's keep going. There's a long pause and then a tired out breath. I think that's self-talk for him. I think he's saying, come on, keep going, keep going. I think he's getting tired throughout this because this is quite a battle. This is a, a tough character to get, get through to or get good answers out of as a prosecutor because he knows how to stick that pig in the black box or whatever wherever we're at with that Easy. one <laughs> with that one now put lipstick on the pig and stick it in a black box wherever we're at on that one now um and so 
and I th- and so it, it, at the start of it, I think, wow, the prosecutor is tired now. He's on his back foot here. However, he does lean forward. He does come back with with a good enough barrage of questions that I think you're right, Chase. What the what the the defendant here decides to do is is drop logic or is his his de- try and try and defeat the logic, drop that idea and go. I'll show them an emotion, and I think that's a baseline change for him. It's a baseline tactic change. I think you're absolutely right. He isn't able to conjure the emotion that he'd like to conjure. What comes forward is the true emotion, and that's anger for the prosecutor. So we get targeted eyes on the prosecutor. We get a top uh, lip very, very tight. We get the upper teeth showing. We get a heavy brow. The brow comes down and the head drops and we get some disgust in the nose as well. Enough information there for me to say he is angry and aggressive at the prosecutor. So at the start of this little battle, I think, ah, prosecutor's on the back foot. Actually, it doesn't take him long to get the 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 um, the person on the stand there, uh, Murdow, uh, on the back foot as well. So great to see that one. Scott, what do you got on this? I agree with you, Mark. And I think I think that happened at the beginning because he'd rehearsed this, this answer. I think in witness prep, he was ready for it. So I think that's what happened because it's so smooth there at the beginning. Everything's just going the way it should. Plenty of illustrators. That's, that lets us know that his, his stress levels drop. So he looks the way he should look. Everything looks fine. But again, let's start taking a look at that brow again because in the last 40 seconds of this clip, that brow is just as smooth as a baby's bottom when you when you look at it. nothing happening and look at the things he's talking about in there when he's doing that not it shouldn't be that way also when he says she's as she she was uh, as safe as she could be well yeah she was as, i think he wanted to say she's as safe as she could be as if you know even if, like if i was there well, we know how that turned out but but I agree with you. He got him he got him uh, backed against the wall there at the very end like that. That was good. Well, let's keep going. You made those calls to Maggie in that four minute period. You had just seen them a few minutes ago when you say you went down there and came right back. Why didn't you just take that quick little left 1,100 yards away and stop by? See why they didn't answer the call. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with them. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by? There was no reason to. I mean, making multiple missed calls to Maggie and she's so close. And there's a driveway right there. Why do you not just go down there and say, hey, guys, I'm heading over there? It, it wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting, I believe I called Maggie and I believe call, I called Paul. But that, that, that's simply me just letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute. I'll be back. The fact that, that they don't answer is not unusual at all. Now, it is odd. It is unusual that they never call me back. Um, and, but, but at that moment, the fact that there's a missed call, when, when I know they're on the property, I mean, that doesn't even register a, at all. I, I, that, that's perfectly normal to try to call somebody who's on the property and not be able to get them. And, and as far as not going down there, uh, there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul, you know? She should be as safe as she could be. And she should. So you're saying that you never called her and had a conversation that day asking her to come home specifically on the night of June 7th, 2021. Maggie and I had a couple of phone conversations that day. What I'm telling you is that before she left, No, I I don't believe we had a phone call about that. We may have discussed it during the phone call, but I didn't make a phone call to her to ask her to come home. I had already told her I wanted her to come home. I always wanted her to come home. You heard Marion say that too, that I always wanted Maggie with me. 
Maggie thought enough of it to talk about it with Marion, didn't she? The fact that I wanted her to come home? Correct. Well, sure. I mean, that's what Marion said. So you're denying that you called Maggie and specifically asked her to come home that night? I didn't make a phone call to Maggie to ask her to come home that night. I asked Maggie to come home long before she ever left. And I probably asked her again each time I talked to her, but I didn't make the phone call specifically for that, as you're saying. And to be clear, I'm certain that if Maggie was certain that she was spending the night, Bubba would have been with her and probably Grady. All right, Chase, what do you got? The, the question was about asking her to come over that night. And the bizarre response that we're seeing here is the result of fear. If you ask yourself what's missing or concealed, just that one question, you'll get the answer of clarity or honesty. Then you might wonder why someone who clearly and obviously asked Maggie to come over would be nervous or fearful about clearly and openly saying that this is what happened. What's truly missing is his ability to comfortably say he wanted her to come over. This is a gigantic issue here. And the problem is with communicating intent which would lead us to believe there's something that he's wanting to conceal about his intention to have her come over. It's clear, it's missing, it's concealed right here, and it's plain as day in something that should otherwise be innocent. There's no other explanation for this behavior, and his complete uh, lack of denial here just means that there's something extremely important being hidden about the intention to ask her to come to the house. Scott. All right. Yeah. Uh, this, I'm going to talk about one thing here. First, let me define absolutist. An absolutist is someone who says every time somebody throws a quick shoulder shrug, then they're lying. Or every time they scratch their nose, that means they're lying. Or every time they do a specific thing, that means they're lying. There are no uh, true deception cues when somebody does so. It doesn't mean they're lying or telling the truth. Having said that, I'm going to say <laughs> most often, I think I found I think I found something here. When we see that that brow furrow like that. In that odd way, I think he's. I think that's when he's he's being deceptive, almost every time. I'm just going to talk about this one thing because I'm horrified. I'm actually saying this is. I did a whole TEDx talk on on absolutism and how it's it's you know how why it bothers me. That's my soapbox. But when we're seeing this thing, almost every time he's being deceptive, and I say almost every time. So so make sure you pay attention to that part of it. But I think that's one of his cues of deception. Because as he's trying to convince that eyebrow, go, the, the brow goes up like that in Greg's request for approval. But at the same time, he's trying to convey that emotion of sadness. And so we get this really weird look in his brow. That's what I think is going on. That's all I'll say about that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, interesting. What you're seeing, I see as well. And the way I categorized it is this. Go back through this video yourself. Pay attention to when his brow furrows. When he's talking about his family, nothing, nothing, nothing. When an eyewitness comes up, all that stuff gets drawn. When you're being assaulted with a question, all that stuff gets drawn. But when he's talking about his wife, forehead's pretty smooth. We also know we have that study from British Columbia University that says that when people are being deceptive, often they'll try to show sadness in their forehead instead of it, it or they'll try to show grief. And what will happen is that whole frontalis muscle will contract and give you a very different approach. So could be that. But when I pay attention to it, I, I wonder why is there no contraction of that muscle except for when this guy is on him and bringing up this eyewitness? I think it's a confrontation between these two guys. I think part of it is because I'm a Murdoch. It, they started the entire thing. If I, When it first started coming out, I think he was on the stand for nine hours. But when I first watched the very first video, he said, aren't you from a legacy of? So he's establishing, this attorney established up front, you're somebody, and then he disrespects him. I think we're seeing that response to the disrespect, to the being pushed in a corner. I don't think it has anything to do with the people. I don't think it has anything to do with the case. I think it has to do with him. Just my opinion. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, a couple of things here that I really love about this. Number one is just how quickly things can change. Because in that last video, start of that, I thought the prosecutor was dead in the water. I thought, like, he's, he's going nowhere with this. He's tired. He's out. And now... 
he's really got this guy under under pressure at this point. We're seeing lots of adaption on the microphone there. Again, doesn't need, there's nothing wrong with the sound. He's just trying to displace energy that's coming from the stress and pressure there. Um, we're seeing swaying from side to side. We're seeing lots of single shrugs as well. But let's look around that to see other elements that suggest something very, very different is happening here. Look at the foot of the guy that's behind the prosecutor. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know whose side that person is on, but I'm going to assume they have a good knowledge of what's going on in the court at the moment, simply because of where they're placed. I don't know who they are, they are, what their job is, whose side they might be on or not, but I'm just assuming because of how upfront they are, they have some status there and therefore some, some knowledge, some intelligence of it. There is a point where the foot rises right up in the air. Now, a foot rising can mean a positive thing or a negative thing, just as Scott says, there are no absolutes, but it's a massive change in that individual's baseline, massive change. Go back, have a look at when that foot rises and what it's around and think to yourself, why is that individual either very positive or very negative about what just happened? Because they know something has changed dramatically and there's an issue there which is either going to do well for somebody or badly for somebody. So you're saying that you never called her and had a conversation that day asking her to come home specifically on the night of June 7th, 2021? Maggie and I had a couple of phone conversations that day. What I'm telling you is you that before she question? left, no, no. I, I don't believe we had a phone call about that. We may have discussed it during the phone call, but I didn't make a phone call to her to ask her to come home. I had already told her I wanted her to come home. I always wanted her to come home. You heard Marion say that too, mm -hmm. that I always wanted Maggie with me. Maggie thought enough of it to talk about it with Marion, didn't she? The fact that I wanted her to come home? Correct. Well, sure. I mean, that's what Marion said. So you're denying that you called Maggie and specifically asked her to come home that night? I didn't make a phone call to Maggie to ask her to come home that night. I asked Maggie to come home long before she ever left. And I probably asked her again each time I talked to her but I didn't make the phone call specifically for that, as you're saying. <clears throat> and to be clear, I'm certain that if Maggie was certain that she was spending the night, Bubba would have been with her and probably Grady. And when you were asked by law enforcement how long you were at your mother's house. You said 45 minutes to an hour. Isn't that correct? I think I said a couple of different things, but I think at one time I did say that. But, you know, at, at, routinely through these things, I kept saying, you know, when you get this data, you'll see exactly. When you look at my phone, you'll see exactly. When you do, you know, so, you know, the, me giving the times was always given with the thought that, okay, that there's own star out there, there's whatever. But when you had a conversation with Miss Shelley after the fact, you actually asked her to say that you were there longer than 20 minutes. You know, I heard Shelley's testimony. I, I, I believe Shelley to be a good person. Uh, I wasn't trying to influence Shelly on any particular length of time because at, at the beginning of this, I believed that data would show what data would show. And for me to tell her to say something when my own star is gonna show something different just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I, I can't answer that. What my recollection is, is that I told Shelly that, that law enforcement would be talking to her we may have discussed how long I was there. At that point in time, if I thought I was there 45 minutes, I may have said I was here 45 minutes, but, you know, I can't tell you. All right. Greg, what do you got?
Yeah, this is a really good example of what happens when a person has had a long time to deconflict and to be prepared to pitch and to defend that lie. Because what happens, and let's assume for a minute he's telling a lie. You know, we all have our opinions, but and that's what all of this is, as Chase will often point out. But this guy is acting like his brain was operating just like it does today that night. Let's assume he did this. His brain would not be operating like it does because we have that switch in our brain that flip, flips us into limbic thought or cat brain. And we're going to do something that seems natural. We're going to delete phone messages. We're going to say, hey, Chase, tell people I was here for 45 minutes. We're not thinking about on star. We're not thinking about that kind of stuff because our rational brain is not functioning. Our protective brain is functioning. So what you should know is that likely if he did this, he would not have thought of all those pieces, no matter how much he knows, because your rational brain is not engaged. I knew that. There's an interesting piece when he says, I knew that, and he starts to go into this stuff about um, about OnStar and car data and that. Watch his blink rate. This is the first time he's had hard eye contact with the guy and blinked like crazy. That's a baseline deviation, which tells you something that he's keenly aware that that's not happening. And then he attacks the witness. I mean, those of you who aren't Southern might not understand when I said, I know she's a fine woman, but... Whether he said but or not, he just said but. That was passive aggressive language for I'm questioning whether or not she is being above board in that. I'll leave it at that and say, uh, Chase, what do you got? Yep, I agree with you. Uh, when innocent people are lied about, they get pissed off universally. And there's almost no exception to this. Guilty people have one major thing in common that's so predictable that it's almost a rule. They have a very hard time calling somebody a liar if that person is telling the truth. And innocent people will clearly, confidently, and comfortably call a lie a lie. His inability to say that's a lie should be scary here. And then he refers to the entire murder and the investigation as this thing, which I thought was extremely unusual. And I think what's interesting here is that we've seen no desire in every single clip for him to clear his name as fast as possible and move on so the perpetrator can be caught. No suggestion that the police should be looking elsewhere. And guilty people will very commonly fear telling the police to look elsewhere or find out who did this out of a fear of attracting attention, because that's a, an attention attractor to do that. And I'll just leave it at that, Scott. All right. At the beginning, he's showing lots of cues of discomfort because he's adjusting that microphone. He's moving around. He's doing his glasses. He's squirming around his seat. And he looks around, his brows furrowed again, and he starts using these stiff illustrators and he starts turtling at the same time. Something's up here. This real his his anger, of course, is growing again. He's getting stressed again, but there's something else going on in there. And with the second answer, that he gives, he starts that swaying from side to side as he goes for that microphone again. Then we see him um, turn in a couple of those uh, short shoulder shrugs as well. So I think what's happening here is he's blending the truth with a lie as you do in these situations, because some things we know happen and some things we don't know what happened, but he's putting those, he's blending those together as a, as a to, to make his story. And I think that's why we're seeing all this odd behavior and that we're seeing the truth and then deception butted up against each other. And I think that's fantastic seeing that and understanding what that is. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think there's a real transition point here in terms of what he's now relying on for his tactic around this. Uh, again, I think the prosecutor has now really got him on a bit of a back foot here. I, it's really excellent the way it's gone because I just wouldn't have seen it going this way. Um, now, why do I think this? Well, just as you say, Scott, the anger is building. Again, we're seeing those adaptions. We're seeing that swaying from side to side, everything that you mentioned uh, right there. But we also get him saying, look, the, the data will show what the data shows. Well, that's not via negative. He's now moved from the via negative of like, well, I don't remember and, and we don't know. And, you know, I'm going to tell you it's this to look look at the data and look at that what what that shows well we know that there's a bit of a lack of data around this so he's on a good foot there but simply from moving from negative to positive as a tactic i think that means he's being forced into a change not he's choosing to change here so i'm interested to see where this goes 
if the prosecution can keep up this pressure and get him somewhere. And when you were asked by law enforcement how long you were at your mother's house, you said 45 minutes to an hour. Isn't that correct? I think I said a couple of different things, but I think at one time I did say that. But, you know, at, at, routinely through these things, I kept saying, you know, when you get this data, you'll see exactly. When you look at my phone, you'll see exactly. When you do, you know, so, you know, the, me giving the times was always given with the thought that, okay, that there's own star out there, there's whatever. But when you had a conversation with Ms. Shelley after the fact, you actually asked her to say that you were there longer than 20 minutes. You know, I heard Shelley's testimony. I, I, I believe Shelley to be a good person. Uh, I wasn't trying to influence Shelley on any particular length of time because at, at the beginning of this, I believed that data would show what data would show. And for me to tell her to say something when my own star is going to show something different just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I, I can't answer that. What my recollection is is that I told Shelley that, that law enforcement would be talking to her. We may have discussed how long I was there. At that point in time, if I thought I was there 45 minutes, I may have said I was here 45 minutes, but, you know, I can't tell you. All right. That Blanca testified to that you talked to her about the clothes that you were wearing that made her uncomfortable, correct? Ask that question again. It's similar to your conversation with Blanca that she testified about when you talked to her about the clothes that you were supposedly wearing what, and what's, it made her feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that testimony, sir? What's similar to that? Well, that you're talking to both of these individuals about their testimony in a manner that's inconsistent with what they know. No, I, I, don't, I, don't, think, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think your assertion is accurate. You have to understand this. On August the 11th, when I went to meet with David Owens, and in that, David Owens asked me about, he showed me that Snapchat and asked me about clothes that I had on. And um, shortly after that, the next time I was with Blanca, I asked Blanca about those clothes because David Owens had asked me about them and was make, made an issue about it. And so I checked with Blanca to see what, what I specifically uh, asked Blanca, and it was an issue to me. So I got Blanca, and I said, I need you to sit down and talk with me about this. This is important. Do you remember um, my clothes when you came to Moselle that day? And she remembered exactly what she testified to. She remembered that my pants were there. She wasn't sure if the shirt was there. At that time, I think she actually thought the shirt was there, but she was clear that she wasn't sure about that. Um, but, or, or no, no, she wasn't unsure, but she didn't remember, um, but assumed that it was. So that was the conversation that, and why I was asking Blanca. Again, you're very specific about your memories of that conversation. Is that correct, Mr. Murdoch? You're dang right. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm consistent about that because a very short time before that, David Owens is asking me questions and telling me I'm a suspect in the murder of my wife and my child and asking me about my clothes. You're dang right it was important. It was important, right. And you're dang right I remember what, why I went to her and for what reason. Because the only thing you're concerned about is yourself. You're not concerned about giving accurate information to law enforcement, correct? What's the reason for that, Mr. Murdoch? Why don't you want to give accurate information to law enforcement? Why do you want to talk to these women who both are employed by you or your family and try to influence what they are going to say? Uh, I, I did want to give law enforcement accurate information. I told a lie about being down there and 
I got myself wed to that, but I wanted to give them as much. I knew that I hadn't done this, and I wanted to give them as much accurate information as I could. But the reason I went to Blanca is specifically because David Owens talking to me on August the 11th. Okay. Greg, what do you got? All right. Exactly. So I, I got a ton of stuff on this one only because I just sitting watching it. He's bleeding everywhere you turn. First of all, outright pause as the guy asks him a question. He gets to, it's almost like he's saying this is a hard one. Then he starts to parse words and these are two lawyers going at it. But he's adapting when he's doing it, and he's turtling. He's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. He does clothes grooming. I'm not going to go in order. I'm just going to tell you everything I see. He grooms his clothing. He does all kinds of adapting. And we say grooming, clothing, and all that. We mean a person's releasing nervous energy in some way, and they get accustomed to doing that over the years, and they become hab habitual for them often. So, for example, a guy who's in front of an audience all the time may straighten his clothes, may do that kind of thing. When he gets to talking about David Owens, boom, 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 that blank rate goes up. This is when he was called in. And the first time they asked him out loud in a police interrogation room, did you kill your wife and son? So his blink rate goes up and he looks down into his right, which we associate with emotion. One of those few things that we see pretty consistently among all people. Now his cadence shift starts to go and he's navigating languages. He tries to speak and as he's attacked about asking this employee, you see his him then um, do the request for approval as he's talking, as he's telling you why he did it and all those kinds of things. We see that request for approval up. Uh, let's see. He does a lip compression and emotional control at one place when he says, you talked to her about what? And then, let's see if I can read my own handwriting. He goes back to that covering himself up in the fact that I've made myself into this martyr because I did lie. I'm wed to that lie. He's using powerful language about I've told you I lied about that night. That's the only lie I've told. And there's a place at the very end where he actually adapts for one of the more powerful things as he touches his face for the first time as he's closing this out. Guys, we don't know what a person's thinking. What we can tell you is when we see all this deviation from what's normal, something else is going on in their head. So when he's telling, go all the way back to the beginning video, when he's telling and hopping along like a little rabbit, one thing's going on. But the minute his brain starts to stutter and he starts to change his speech pattern and we see adapters and we see him pulling back and wrapping himself in all of his good glory that he's done something good by telling you that he lied and he's telling you about all of his sins. What we're seeing here is a person now getting backed into the corner. And I think, Mark, you talked about it last time. This guy's got him back in the ropes. Two back-to-back -back eyewitnesses. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Just like three videos ago, I thought the prosecutor was dead in the water. I thought this guy's done. He may as well walk out now. He's he's now got this guy. This this defendant is now doing full improvisation, I think. I don't think he's rehearsed any elements of this certainly put together in this it's an absolute dog's dinner of a story going on here uh, y uh absolutely right uh greg we got the we get the glasses coming off as well that's a a break from the baseline as well there's uh, the blink rate is going right up all the other things that you've mentioned there he's now using he would do the mic adaption there but he's now using that to break eye contact and look at the mic so he's using that as more of a barrier a shield so he can have a break from it i think it's fascinating uh what's what's happening here and i'm fascinated to see where it goes because i'm kind of hopeful uh ab about it scott what do you got on this one all right uh at that first question we see him lean back a little bit and this can indicate a couple of things it can indicate he doesn't understand what's happening or he feels like it's aggressive and it's kind of hitting him weird but he did he or, but i think he doesn't understand the question i think it's it's a combination of both. i think he doesn't understand it and it sort of takes him aback a little bit as it hits him then we're seeing cues of aggression as his head comes forward and his eyes lock on the prosecutor. So I think you're, I think you're right about that, Mark. He's, he's getting a little bit worried at this point. Then he grabs the mic and he pulls on, it, he starts fidgeting around a little bit. Then he takes his glasses off and his vocal tone gets a little bit louder and a little bit more harsh. So you nail all that stuff as well from what I'm seeing too. And then uh, as when, check this out, when he's talking uh, to the jury, he, he turns toward the jury as they're to his right. When he's being all emotional, when he's, when he's crying and stuff, he, he's 
cognizant enough in there to go, okay, I need to let the jury see me being emotional. See, that's another thing that bugs me about this guy. The only time he turns toward them hard is when he's being all emotional. But when he's being angry, he fully turns toward uh, the prosecutor. Now, watch when he's being emotional and deal with the prosecutor at the same time. He, he'll he he'll lock his head just, he'll just go back far enough just so they can still see his face. And he'll track him with his eyes like that predator look we saw earlier. And they'll track him like that, the the prosecutor. Otherwise, he's wanting the, the jury to see his, his emotion and how sad he is about everything, which is, I'm under the impression, is, is fake as well. And then you're right, Greg, he grabs that, uh, his face and scratches on that to get rid of some of that built up stress and tension. I th I think he's he's stressed here. He's worried because he's gotten back in the corner, but at the same time, he's trying to pay attention to what's happening uh, emotionally uh, that he's supposed to be showing the jury. So I think let's start paying attention to where he's aiming when he's emotional because we're going to see that come into play again here in a few minutes. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and in, in cases like this where there's limited emotional expression and there's minimal behavior cues, you can kind of just default to the analysis of what's missing, left out, or concealed. So with the questions uh, he's being asked, the attorney picks up very specific points. So which of these points is being concealed? Let's take a look. Number one, refusal to call somebody a liar or express that their testimony is inaccurate or false. Next is a refusal to discuss even having made these women uncomfortable, which was part of the question. Next is a refusal to discuss their testimony. And if it's false, it would take center stage, by the way. If their testimony was false, he would have made it center stage. Next is a refusal to discuss or even mention the attempt to influence these women's testimony. So these bits of concealment paint a gigantic red arrow in a certain direction. They come together to point collectively toward one what I think is a scary potential conclusion here. In just this clip alone, you can see how if you're able to just go through a clip and only spot what's being concealed or left out, all of those items become a voice or an arrow that guide you precisely to what questions to ask or what happened in the situation in question. That Blanca testified to that you talked to her about the clothes that you were wearing that made her uncomfortable, correct? Ask that question again. It's similar to your conversation with Blanca that she testified about when you talked to her about the clothes that you were supposedly wearing what, and made her feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that testimony, sir? What's similar to that? Well, that you're talking to both of these individuals about their testimony in a manner that's inconsistent with what they know. No, I, I, don't, I, don't, think, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think your assertion is accurate. You have to understand this, on August the 11th, when I went to meet with David Owens, and in that, David Owens asked me about, he showed me that Snapchat and asked me about clothes that I had on. And um, shortly after that, the next time I was with Blanca, I asked Blanca about those clothes because David Owens had asked me about them and was make, made an issue about it. And so I checked with Blanca to see what, what I specifically uh, asked Blanca and it was an issue to me. So I got Blanca and I said, I need you to sit down and talk with me about this. This is important. Do you remember um, my clothes when you came to Moselle that day? And she remembered exactly what she testified to. She remembered that my pants were there. She wasn't sure if the shirt was there. At that time, I think she actually thought the shirt was there, but she was clear that she wasn't sure about that. Um, but, or, or no, no, she wasn't unsure, but she didn't remember, um, but assumed that it was. So that was the conversation that, and why I was asking Blanca. Again, you're very specific about your memories of that conversation. Is that correct, Mr. Murdoch? You're dang right. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm consistent about that because a very short time before that, David Owens is asking me questions and telling me I'm a suspect in the murder of my wife and my child. 
and asking me about my clothes, you're dang right it was important. It was important, right. And you're dang right I remember what, why I went to her and for what reason. Because the only thing you're concerned about is yourself. You're not concerned about giving accurate information to law enforcement, correct? What's the reason for that, Mr. Murdoch? Why don't you want to give accurate information to law enforcement? Why do you want to talk to these women who both are employed by you or your family and try to influence what they are going to say? Uh, I, I did want to give law enforcement accurate information. I told a lie about being down there, and I got myself wed to that. But I wanted to give them as much I knew that I hadn't done this, and I wanted to give them as much accurate information as I could. But the reason I went to Blanca is specifically because David Owens talking to me on August the 11th. Okay. You got out of the car, according to what you told law enforcement, repeatedly, and went and checked the bodies, correct? before you called 911. Is that correct? No, sir, that's not correct. You don't, you're saying you didn't say that to law enforcement? I don't know what I said to law enforcement, Mr. Waters, but I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. I pulled up, and I saw Max and Paul Paul. I jumped out of that car. I know that I went back to my car, and I called 911 as quickly as I could that point in time when I got on the phone, then is when I went to them and did the things that I did. So, but you were what you're saying is not accurate. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911. When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't. If I did say that, I, I don't believe that's accurate. Did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. No, sir. That's not, that's, not, I don't, that's not accurate. At least that's not what I remember. That's not what you remember saying, or that's not what you say now happened? No, that's not what. That's not what I believe happened. Okay, but you don't deny that's what you said. Did I said, did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. I don't believe that's what I said. <coughs> now I know I checked them but I don't believe I checked them before I called 911. Because I, I can pretty well remember vividly. When I checked Paw Paw, I was already on the phone with 911. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll keep this one short. We see grief muscle for the first time, and he goes down the well. What I call down the well is when you pull up emotion to make you teary-eyed and that kind of thing. I can't tell for tears. I don't see any. Maybe it's just me. Um, I don't even see like a snotty nose. I see kind of a little bit of red in his nose, a little bit of that kind of stuff. When you ask, he starts then to push and corral the question in a way that he gets to answer what he wants to answer. And once he gets back to that topic where he's comfortable responding, you see all that tearing and all that stuff dry up. One of my best indicators of person's crying or trying to cry is people who cry <laughs> have interrupted breath. His respiration is up and not interrupted. I would be like, okay, let's just wait this one out because he's going to come right back to normal. And I don't see it as that. There's also no heavy swallowing. We associate with crying. Um, as we say, no snotty nose. I'll just, 
leave it at that and say, I think what this guy is doing is he's trying to prey on that emotional piece. This is all at the end of the day after establishing a shadow of a doubt. And if he is in grief and all of that, then people may have a shadow of a doubt. Look, this guy's told us all of his qualms, all the things he's done wrong, all of his weaknesses. I think we're still playing down that show. And I don't see what looks like real crime to me. Could be wrong. Scott, what do you got? I think this is interesting because he's trying to conjure up emotion, that emotion to grief. And that's what those mouth noises are about. And, and the, the mouth grooming, that's what that's all about. Then he calls his wife Mags and his son, Paul, Paul. Up to this point, I think he's called her Mags and called him Paul. These are these little endearing, endearing terms of affection that people use to make the jury feel sorry for him, to feel more empathetic for that, for what they're going through. Because, oh, he called them these cute little sweet little names. That's what he's doing there, calling those names. And notice when he does call them that. It's always in this big emotional thing as he's facing the jury. So let's still keep an eye on when he's going back and forth uh, emotionally with the jury. Um, and then watch how how fast that that fake expression of emotion goes away, how, how fast it disappears. And then when that thing disappears, watch how fast he he turns back to the, the uh, prosecutor and can track him better without having to worry about uh, showing emotion to the jury. That's all I'll say on that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so look, let me put a little litmus test on whether this might be real crying or not real crying, and you do this for yourselves as well. So just so you know, in most personality tests, I will rank very, very low in, in empathy, very, very high in analysis, which means that I can somebody might be having an emotion and I'm not likely to feel that emotion. I'm likely to be able to go, look, I think this emotion is happening because here's what I see happening. That doesn't mean I'm not emotion, uh, I'm emotionless. Of course I have emotions. And so the thing is, is that if it's a real emotion and a big powerful emotion, usually that will affect me. And that's a good litmus test for me because I think, well, normally I'd be quite analytical about this, but I'm actually feeling a lot of empathy for this person. Chances are this is absolute real emotion. Why? Because real emotions that are strong are designed to get action out of other human beings immediately. And so I'm a social human being. So emotions work on me, even though in personality tests, I will rank pretty low. Here's how I come out of, uh, of this um, display with this person. I feel absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. And I could go into the analysis of what's not right, just as Greg was saying there, the breathing's not right, you know, the, this, the skin tone isn't right, there's so much analytically isn't right. But if that were a real strong emotion about seeing your, your family dead, I would feel that and I rank super low on empathy, but I would have empathy for that. I got zero empathy, probably means it's not, it's not the real thing. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, you're saying that the mouth grooming is off the charts here. We tend to do this to improve our appearance and we do it. It's unconscious. And if it's done during deception, the brain does everything it can do to improve the appearance of the lie or the person during the lie. So mouth grooming, especially when you see a spike of mouth grooming behavior like this one, is one of the hallmarks that we tend to see, especially when it's isolated from all the other behaviors, meaning they don't do it all the time. So this mouth grooming is not in his baseline behavior at all. And he starts reorienting his body to the jury in a way that's almost like a, a prank TV show. Like there, somebody trained him, like every time you feel emotion, you have to turn to that jury. And he's probably been telling people to do this for a long time. I have no doubt that he's been doing that. And he thinks it works. And he shifts before the emotions begin. So before he thinks the emotions are ready for display, then he turns to the jury. And his eye contact to the prosecution after the during the question is now locked on while he's trying to display sadness at the same time. His blink rate drops to zero during this point, which is an extreme indicator of focus. So which if tears were in his eyes, this would be hard to do to drop your blink rate like this. This is an indicator of extreme focus and attention. The sadness somehow goes away for all the key parts of the story. Every key part, the entire expression and everything about sadness disappears. And he becomes just emotionless and sadness kind of goes away. And when somebody's being truthful, 
uh, and can't remember something, they tend to say one thing almost every single time. If they're being truthful and can't remember, they say, I don't remember. He makes an attempt at saying, I don't remember, but the moment he's pressed on it, you'll see that he breaks down. He realizes that the strategy is not working. And when you press a truthful person, they will continue saying they don't know. You know why? Because they don't know. You got out of the car, according to what you told law enforcement repeatedly, and went and checked the bodies, correct? Before you called 911, is that correct? No, sir, that's not correct. You don't, you're saying you didn't say that to law enforcement? I don't know what I said to law enforcement, Mr. Waters, but I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. I pulled up and I saw my ex and Paul Paul. I jumped out of that car. I know that I went back to my car and I called 911 as quickly as I could. That point in time, when I got on the phone, then is when I went to them and did the things that I did. So, but you were what you're saying is not accurate. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911. When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't. If I did say that, I, I don't believe that's accurate. Did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. No, sir. That's not, that's, not, I don't, that's not accurate. At least that's not what I remember. That's not what you remember saying, or that's not what you say now happened? No, that's not what. That's not what I believe happened. Okay, but you don't deny that's what you said. Did I said, did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. I don't believe that's what I said. <coughs> now I know I checked them but I don't believe I checked them before I called 911. Because I, I can pretty well remember vividly. When I checked Paul Paul, I was already on the phone with 911. I saw them, and I know I jumped out of my car. Um, but I believe that before I checked them, in fact, I'm almost certain, that then I went back and I got my, that's when I went and got my phone and I called 911. Okay. And then, after I called 911, they, they, I mean, there was a little while where there wasn't, I don't, I don't think there was anything going on. And I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. What you're saying here today, now that we have this data, that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements. Is that correct? No, sir. I disagree with that. Okay. I totally disagree with that, Mr. Waters. Will you point to what you're talking about? All right, Chase, what do you got? Don't believe. These are two words we do not use to describe facts, like ever. And you hear it all the time in here. I don't believe I made a decision to lie. 
such a great line. I want to get that on a bumper sticker somewhere. I don't believe that I was lying at that point. That's a direct quote here. I don't believe that I was lying at that point. And he says, I don't believe it was a lie. So, and he said, uh, later in this video, he says, my dear friend, Chief Alexander, gave him some piece of advice to do something. This is borrowing credibility, borrowing authority from, from another person. And his eyebrows are constantly raised. And I think this is his innocence behavior. And he's learned to display this to appear innocent. You can even see it in the body cam footage when he's communicating to the officer and he wants to appear innocent and blameless. And this nodding that he's doing at the end, we saw in the first video he did when he was in the police car. We saw it many times throughout the trial. We saw it twice on the body cam footage. He does this every time that he's uncertain and wants to appear comfortable. And he does it precisely at these moments that he's offering up something that's not very credible and wants people to accept it, which is so far as I've seen, in my opinion. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so another reason for me, it feels like this is not true feeling that he's... Um, creating here or, or, or emoting here and that it's conjured up and conjured up badly uh, is in my experience of helping performers all over the world at some incredibly high levels deliver emotions is when they're real when they get them for real they come so fast and powerful that the actor forgets to hide themselves and what happens when emotions come and they're not quite right they're not good enough the actor feels disappointed in them, that it's not really true, it's not quite right, and they'll put their head into shade, as you're seeing there with his head. They'll hide their eyes because they don't want to show you. Like, this is not really top quality gold emotion. Don't don't watch the whole of my face. You'll see how false this is. There's not a, um, it's not that there's not a pride in it. It's just when real emotion comes, it happens so fast that you don't have a moment to socially hide yourself. Later on in the emotion, when you might feel embarrassed about that motion or emotion or worried about it, or it's stressful for you or the other people, later on, you might start some hiding behaviors. But right early on, in my experience, people don't. He hides his feelings right from the start. And that's because I think he knows that they're not good enough. It's not a good performance. It isn't the gold that he's hoping to deliver to the jury at this point. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, just a handful of things, but all powerful. Um, one is you hear that, that blowout, that breath. I learned a new term from our friend Rodney Smith this week. Maybe you guys all know it from Polygraph. I didn't descending staircase breathing. I always just said controlled breathing, but Rodney's an investigator for North Carolina, and he explained, he's a polygrapher, and he explained that to me as one of the things they look for. I always just said, catch up breathing. You know, I've been sitting there controlling my breathing. People exasperated or they're trying to catch up. They blow out air. I didn't see when he starts down this whole thing, he blows that out, and the grief muscle disappears. Now, we're still talking about finding your child, but now we're talking about something else. We're talking about whether I said that or not. He gets really polite, he gets good eye lock, and he follows the guy across the room as the guy walks away. Powerful, you can't miss it. And, and Chase, I am dead on with you. I don't believe. We should have a t-shirt that says, I don't believe I committed a lie. We could do something like that. I ran construction for years and I always tell my people, ch church words like hope, feel, and believe are church words. They're not thinking words, they're not, I did not do this, I think this. I evaluated and, but we get, he does that. The other thing that we notice here is he is getting smaller and smaller, and he doesn't just turtle. He puts the top of his skull toward this prosecutor more than one time. If that's not feeling defeat, if you don't see something creeping in that we know that he's starting to feel the, the pressure of two eyewitnesses and you lied to the police in the thing that you told us you didn't and you're getting caught in words, I don't know what it takes. Mark, uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, mine's going to be super short. He, he uh, grabs the mic again and he, tur he turns toward the jury again and he shows all this, he's doing all that weird mouth grooming stuff at the top and he's just getting, it's just getting weird, but there are no tears. And there's like you're saying, Greg, there's no snot. So it's, this is all just fake. And then w once he gets that done and delivers all that, you see that emotion almost completely disappear. There's, again, there's no snipping. There's no Kleenex. He was, remember he was 
had that Kleenex before and he was goofing around with it, but he never really used it. In the court, some of the court things he did use it, but he just kept rubbing his nose with it. And that's why his nose is all red at some points because he just kept sticking this Kleenex up his nose and pushing it around, but nothing, but it was the same one the whole time. He never changed. It was gross. If it had been real, it would have been really gross, but it, I think it was fake. So it was just, ugh. I saw them. And I know I jumped out of my car. Um, but I believe that before I checked them, in fact, I'm almost certain, that then I went back and I got my, that's when I went and got my phone and I called 911. Okay. And then after I called 911, they, I mean, there was a little while where there wasn't, I don't, I don't think there was anything going on. And I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. point that what you're saying here today now that we have this data that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements is that correct no sir i disagree with that okay. i totally disagree with that mr waters will you point to what you're talking about At least on this one, at some point during this interview, when you were able to plan your lie about this event, and you made that decision, uh, it, but it wasn't what we just played. It wasn't yet. It was some point after that. I don't think that's a lie right there. Is is the reason why I don't think that it's occurred before this? Because what I'm saying there. I believe to be truthful and I know have? I know this I know for a fact that when David Owens asked me about my relationship with my wife and my child I know that that played a role in that mm -hmm. and I believe that and I may be wrong but I believe that this was before that you ever heard the expression not telling the whole truth is the same as telling the lie sure I have that's something you understood as a lawyer and a, and a prosecutor? Yes. <clears throat> All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just one thing. I just love that idea. I don't think that's a lie. I think that's fan fantastic. Uh, that That is a... It, Put in in the in the notes down below. Put in the discussion down below if you really do fancy a T-shirt on that or or anything else. I I will mock it up for you. I'll put it up there. Um, we'll make it as cheap as possibly we can. If if you want that or any other, stick that in the notes uh, below and uh, and let's get it done. I don't think that was a lie. Chase, what do you got on this one? Let's do one more. Uh, what I'm saying there, I believe to be truthful. <laughs> That's a good one. Beautiful. And this is just more lawyer speak, and truthful people just don't do this. And right as he's speaking about the question about his relationship with the victims, he pulls his jacket closed, which we call barrier creation. And as he's doing that, uh, Zoom's trying to give me a thumbs up emoji right now on my screen. It did it earlier for you. It did it earlier. It actually got one up there for some reason. I don't know how. All right. And then there's a confirmation glance. Uh, and a pause. So we call it a confirmation glance and a pause to ensure that he's being listened to. And Scott, I'm going to go along with this. And I'm glad you brought this up first because I had this in my notes. I'd like okay. to present a case for absolutes, but only one, a, a short one. And I'll use you as an example, Scott. Okay. If I ask Scott if anybody in his neighborhood is making drugs in their house and he says, not to the best of my knowledge, or I don't believe so, those answers could be factual and truthful. But if I ask Scott if he is making drugs in his house and his answer is not to the best of my knowledge, or I don't believe so, those answers are absolutely ridiculous. 
So the responses are the same, but the context is different. And I think this is why a checklist is only as good as the person's ability to determine contextual relevance. That's all I've got. Greg? Yeah, so a few things. He's adapting like all hell. I mean, everything is coming up to adapt now. You're right. It, I think the barrier, but it's also a, a, a grooming appearance thing. So he's trying to look better as he's talking. Listen to his words. I don't think that's a lie. I believe. But he knows for a fact one thing. He goes, I don't believe that's a lie. I, I don't think that's a lie. I believe. I believe. I know for a fact that when he asked me the question about my relationship with Paul and Maggie is when I decided to lie. Well, guess who else knows for a fact that? We knew that for a fact. Go back and watch the first video. We all red flagged on him about that. I, in fact, said, this is my favorite clip of all time because you get to see real baseline between wonderful and wonderful. So go back and watch it because all those red flags we saw through those video in the car are showing up now. That He's actually telling you with his own mouth that that's when he decided to lie. Now, is he telling the truth? Hard to tell with this guy. I lied, I lied, I lied. Please believe me, I lied. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, and I think he's doing that I lied, I lied, I lied thing because he's trying to show that now he's stopped all the lying. He's being honest. I think he's trying that that big reverse on everybody. I don't think it's going to, hopefully it won't take. I don't think it'll take. Uh, but this is the, uh, up to this point, this is the loudest and most animated he's been. You're right, Greg. He's all over the place. So far, this is, he's almost like a cartoon. His blink rates through the roof. Is ed he's editing and arranging everything. He's just looking around, thinking and talking, and, and all this is on the fly. Like Mark was saying earlier, where he's just he's just going for it, man. And some of these things. And again, like Joe Navarro says, you can have a poker face, but you can't have a poker body. And it, as hard as he tries to keep all that in and, and look like he's telling the truth, it's not working at all. Not even a little bit, in my opinion. I just want to be clear, though. At least on this one, at some point during this interview, when you were able to plan your lie about this event, and you made that decision, uh, but it wasn't what we just played. It wasn't yet. It was some point after that. I don't think that's a lie right there is, is the reason why I don't think that it's occurred before this, because what I'm saying there. I believe to be truthful, and I know, know I know this. I know for a fact that when David Owens asked me about my relationship with my wife and my child, I know that that played a role in that, and I believe that, and I may be wrong, but I believe that this was before that. You ever heard the expression, not telling the whole truth is the same as telling the lie? Sure I have. That's something you understood? as a lawyer and a, and a prosecutor? Yes. <clears throat> All right, well, Mark, so far, what do you think we've been seeing here? What do you what, what do you got? So far, this is a great lesson for me in it's not over until it's over. I thought that prosecutor was done halfway through this. He's back. He's doing a great job on a really hard candidate here. So just fantastic to see somebody on the ropes. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I just wish he would have nailed him down on the non-answer questions a little bit more. But this video is a masterclass in determining deception in trained deposition experts. It's full of all the hallmarks that you would look for in depo experts. Hesitancy, psychological distancing, severity softening, non-answers, uh, chronology, pronoun absence, ambiguity, politeness, mini confessions, exclusions, qualifiers, chronological discrepancies. If you wanted a checklist of what to look for when a politician's being questioned, that's it. You're welcome. I'll do a, a Zoom <laughs> thing. Greg? <laughs> yeah, it's been trying to give you one of those all day, Chase, so you should get it. So I'm going to add to the list that Chase had. I'm just going to say, look, this guy is prepped. This guy has prepared himself. It doesn't matter how much you prepare yourself. You can de-conflict your story as much as you want to. And when you get right up to someone else who has thought of other details you haven't, then you're going to bleed information to you. You can't have a poker body. What happens is I've got this perfect story until you start poking. And oh, and 
Then Bobby and Susie said this. Oh, well, now I got to deal with that. So we're seeing him dealing with that deconflict on the fly instead of having time to go back, sit in his hotel room, make up new details and come. That creates a really different autonomic response in the body. And the reason we say this is because stress is what we're looking for. And clusters of stressful behavior that deviate from the baseline mean that we're seeing something going on in the person's head. Can't read his mind, but it's not looking good. Scott, what are you seeing to this point? So far, I think we've seen everything that we always talk about pretty much. We've seen everything from loping to editing to you name it. And there we, we've pretty much seen it. If you go through this again, you'll learn so much. If you go to the very beginning and watch the, through the whole video, because we cover everything in this one. So I think it's a great study to see um, all the things we talk about. And the people and the panelists who've been watching this long are going to be able to go through and just knock these out as they watch it the first time. And then, of course, watch it again so you can uh, get that locked in your brain as we go through. All right, fellas, I think this was another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?